Hi there, how are you doing? It's your girl Crank here. Today is Sunday. How are you doing? Happy Sunday. I think it might be the 28th of May. I am coming from a vehicle because the sun is currently setting and um, I took forever and a day to come and chat today and so I want to capitalize on daylight hours and that's why I'm in my car. It's a bit messy all up in the background so I hope that you will be not distracted by that uh, for whatever reason. Okay, cool. So, uh, man, a lot is on my mind and I guess I just need to like share it. I need to talk about it. I need to just kind of bring forward what it is that is chilling on them. Uh, did I greet in the name of Christ? If not, hello. I'm coming in the name of Jesus. I'm talking, I'm here to talk about something. Of course, I always am. So, um, sooner we get this started, the better so that the sun does not set while we're still wrapping. Okay. So I am a child of God. I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. The work that I do, I do it for the Lord. Um, everything I do is about the Lord. I am a persecuted Christian, so I'm really just going through it in life. And um, everything just hurts. Like, my whole body hurts. My heart is always broken. I'm always in some kind of a bad space, right? But I conquer it uh, by the Holy Spirit because I trust God to get me out of darkness, okay? Despite appearing to not be going anywhere. So today, I want to talk about those people that are inducing this pain in me or they're at least leaving it that way i want to talk about what's going on i am a human being and i suspect i might also be talking to human beings unless of course i'm chatting to a youtube algorithm which is going to like censor my content i'm actually talking to a human being or to some human beings um god has made us all with a suite of emotions he has made us with <clears throat> cognition with ways of reacting to certain things and he did that deliberately because it is important that we as human beings make each other understand what is going on in each other's hearts in order that our relationships might be cool might be good right oh goodness like i'm sorry my eyes are irritated and i need to figure out what's irritating my eyes um the moisturizer that i bought uh i don't know like it's relatively gentle on my face but my eyes like are burning so i don't know if it's a combination of the coconut oil or what because coconut oil makes me feel like this or if i need to like make sure that that moisturizer that i use stays very far away from my eyes i can't like figure what's going on but they just are so irritated anyway uh hopefully as i continue to chat that irritation will subside the lord made us with um with emotions guys he did and these emotions are supposed to guide us or guard us in light of how to react or how to treat a particular situation to protect ourselves basically um from not getting what we need in life and when people ignore them they only go out of their way to break their own hearts if there is one thing that i've gotten right all of my life even before coming to christ and i say it's getting it right it's not a weakness it is not it is not even though human beings have gone on to reduce it to a weakness the one thing that i have had going down for myself all throughout my life is the fact that i've always worn my heart on my sleeve i don't really understand people who ignore their feelings um literally you know when they say a person is an open book that's me and so for those reasons i find people really strange when they ignore feelings because feelings have power to either really greatly improve a person's life or devastate it entirely like feelings have power to make or break a life and so to ignore such an important thing um I find people who do that very defeatist. I do. I find them defeatist and it's also very uncomfortable that they, they, there are so many of them on earth. That level of defeatism confirms to me, frankly, that demons are real. It confirms to me that human beings are fallen. It confirms to me that God is real. Oh goodness, there's no mirror here. I, I was like, there's something in my eye that I want to get out. I think it's an eyelash. Oh goodness gracious, man. Like, can I have more challenges in just one sitting? Anyway, whatever, like people who ignore their feelings tax me, uh, they, they tax my understanding. Oh, here's a mirror. Uh, they tax my understanding. Like I literally see the eyelash that is causing me this discomfort and it won't come out. Oh, sorry, it finally came out. But not before making me all teary eyed. So we're just gonna have to take that in our stride, aren't we? Yeah, well, this is actually how I feel like emo, very heartbroken. Uh, so I guess my eyelashes helped. Uh, yeah, no, feelings have power to make or break people, guys. And when then people ignore them, for me, it's like, whoa, can you be more masochistic? 
can you be more self-afflicting? And the uncomfortable thing about uh, people who ignore their feelings is that they eventually get to a point where they can't ignore them anymore. And then they want to go and fulfill their feelings. But by then, they have so freaking devastated and shattered the people that they acted a fool in front of. Um, that these people might have just kind of shut them out or have decided that you're too painful to you know keep around like you're literally too painful to keep around and so in order to protect this heart of mine that is on my sleeve i can't let you come back um jesus gave us a suite of such emotions precisely so that we can protect ourselves from future heartbreak so run with what you feel inside your heart and see what it produces and if it doesn't produce what you wanted it to produce you tried you will not have any regret hanging out inside you you will know that you did everything that you could in order to try and fulfill the desire of your heart, but it did not work, okay? That helps you heal, that helps you move on, that helps you not have regret, because how can you regret something that could never have happened? You know what I mean? So when it comes to um, romance, uh, when it comes to uh, the passion that comes with romantic relationships, we know that Jesus Christ uh, describes his own relationship with um, the church as a marriage. He describes it similarly to romance because he knows how we know or understand romance. There are many feelings between people in this world, many different kinds of love between people in this world. There is love between mother and child, love between father and daughter. There is love between brother and brother, brother and sister, love between friends. And then there's love between husband and wife or, you know, a romantic couple. And those of you who have lived beyond the age of perhaps five, uh, okay, let me not say five, but whatever might be a mature enough age, old enough age to actually develop a crush like feelings, uh, romantic ones for the opposite sex. Uh, I'm not going to get into an LGBTQIA debate. We're not. It's supposed to be just girls and boys here. Okay. Um, when you have been, when you're old enough to have had any kind of crush on a person, right? Or feelings on, on a person, you would know that it's different. It's different. It's not the same as all different kinds of other love. It's, it's not the same as friends, love between friends or love between mother and daughter or love between, um, siblings. When, when your sister uh, that, that would be a love between siblings, right? When your sister doesn't call you, when she said she would call you, um, you might be upset, you might feel some kind of way, but languish, mourn, cry, grovel, basically be laid waste, hardly ever happens. You might call them the next day, or when they do finally call you, be like, dude, you're so unreliable. My goodness, you said you were going to call and you didn't. When your sister doesn't come through for you, when she says that I'm going to rock up at your recital and then doesn't, yeah, you're going to be upset that you, you're supposed to be supportive, but you're not. But languish, moan, grovel, roll around in the mud uh, irrevocably to a point where you feel like you can't even wake up and get your, your butt to school the next day or get your butt to work the next day. Like getting you, give, feeling heavy in bed with no ability to give yourself like energy. That No, 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 no. If your best friend stands you up because you were supposed to go and have milkshakes at the mall and play bowling. And you, like, it stood up. Like, you just went, end up just sitting there at the bowling alley and she doesn't pitch. Yeah, you'll be angry. You'll be upset. You'll feel like you wasted your petrol if you drove or your taxi fare, right? You will feel dumb and stupid and you will want to just, like, tell this girl out or cuss her out or whatever, right? But when you go home after being disappointed, there's yes, likely maybe you might tell your mom, can you believe what Lerato did? My goodness, like, she stood me up and she didn't even pick up her phone and I went all the way to Rosebank and she wasn't there. Uh, and then you will go into your bedroom, maybe send her a really harsh text on some never again, like it's over best friend, you, like you freaking suck. Yeah, you might do that. But languish, moan, grovel, be unable to sleep, struggle to wake up the next morning, struggle to go to work the next day, struggle to see yourself pushing a day at the job, on the job, um, without thinking about how this friend of yours wreaked havoc. Hard, like, no, hardly ever. Hardly ever. Like, it's different. Romantic love is different. It is different. It is so different. Even your mom or dad, like if they did, I don't know how many times. As a child growing up, I got disappointed by my father. Uh, my dad was a deadbeat dad, absent, like no man's business, like really, frankly, he didn't deserve to have children. And there was a time when he promised, when we were still very young, could be under the age of 10, and he promised that he was going to pick us up to go and get our hair dead, hey? To go and get our hair relaxed and um, go and have like some lunch afterwards and spend the day with dad. This was after him and my mom had gotten divorced, so we didn't always see him. Uh, my mom and my dad got divorced when we, I was five, my older sister was seven. So 
like I said, it was under 10, but it was after their divorce. And so seeing him was like a delicacy. It was like a rare event type thing. Um, and, and my father like rocked up in the morning that day and was like, children, get bath ready. We're going to go to the salon to go do hair uh, and then spend the day ha having fun. And then you're going to eat, you know, we're going to have lunch and we bath. And we were so excited. And my dad like he left and didn't come back he didn't come back i mean we were in pain uh i sat in front of the television that night still half waiting for him to like rock up my older sister moved on quite quickly but i was sad the next day however i was playing with my friends on this on the playground i didn't expect my dad to come um i was not really angry i mean i was a child so such bad feelings and heavy strong ones um start to come about a little bit later on when you become a, pr a pubescent a prepubescent or a puberty stricken adolescent that's when you start to harbor feelings of resentment against fathers and mothers who disappoint you but usually in toddler years or younger preteen years you tend to be a lot more forgiving so i don't even remember being pissed off at him or upset i'm sorry i don't even think god is okay with that word um but i do remember being very sad up until the end of that day but the next day i was playing with my friends again so even when uh parents disappoint us don't rock up at our recitals don't pay our fees don't you know because my mom has like done me dirty my goodness like yeah <laughs> to this day like i am a woman that has been done dirty by her mother and she doesn't care that my life is basically dissipating and falling apart and being shattered into a million pieces um and that stuff hurts. I'm, I'm like, I've got a lot of angst inside me about the way that my mom is treating me. But do I lose sleep? Oh my goodness. Like, no. Do I gravel? Do I pine? I'm upset. I come here and I talk about it. If I work out, I have a full day, a schedule where I've given myself energy. I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly able to conquer what my mom is doing to me. I call it, um, what do you call this? Uh, hunger suppression like the hunger that i have in my heart for my mom's love i suppress it with this work that i do like the fact that she doesn't care for me i find other things to do i look in other directions to understand and then i just kind of like move on with my life um even in this persecution like she is the biggest and, ba and baddest bane of my existence my greatest afflictor the grandest um stabber in my back betrayer but i conquer i conquer by just doing other things and focusing in other ways, I find a way to suppress my appetite for the love that I want for my mom. Uh, the same is true of all the other relatives that have done this to me. I am great at suppressing, right? Um, that, that would be my mom. I, I don't grovel. I don't languish. I don't like sit in bed. Like, like really. Like, I don't just get attacked in the middle of watching a show on TV by sorrow. Like, a deep amount of it. I... I'm just like, oh, whatever. How dare you? Like, what la? And like, oh, oh, you don't appreciate me. Like, I just have this, like, watch me one day be better than bigger whenever it comes to my mom. Same thing with friends. I've been crushed. I've been shattered. I've been devastated um, by friends, you know, best friends and everything. Like, uh, they are presently actually currently watching me die on social media. And they are not lifting a finger. They don't care. It's like, whatever. If I die, they wouldn't even attend my funeral because they'd probably be embarrassed that they did this to me as a conglomerate. So that's what I'm facing a lot of friends I used to have. Um, and I mean, these chicks that did me dirty, like dirty, dirty. Some of them are dudes. <laughs> but I conquer. I have a way to, you know, know not be so hungry for their love their validation their approval and their loyalty i conquer watch me languish like pine literally just be curl up like a fetus in bed struggle with appetite to eat struggle to sleep be over a friend i mean yo girl i love you but <laughs> i'm gonna find another friend like that's what's good like you're you suck you, you are unloyal you're not right or die and so for those reasons like you don't make sense in my life in the first place so i have and people would know i mean this is true i bet you can relate um that all other relationships whatever they might be do not cause the level of languishing just languishing that comes about when romance is not working out um even the relationship between mother and child it does not bring about the level of languishing a mother might be very worried about their kid when they're out for like a like two days the whole weekend not coming home worry that the kid might be dead but as soon as the kid comes back home yeah arguments ensue punishments curfews uh being grounded all that jazz and there might be enmity between mom and son or mom and daughter in the house you know walking past each other giving each other the cold shoulder there's like a little bit of a, an icy antarctic breeze going on in the house and so there's like not normal relations between mom and daughter or mom and son um but for the mother or even the son or daughter to just languish, like, literally eat dust, not be able to come up for air, be unable to breathe because their mom is punishing them or their mom is ignoring them or their mom is not paying their fees or whatever. No, like people just do not feel the same kind of exorbitant, like flatten me to the ground like I'm a carpet type pain um, with other kinds of relationships other than romance. Like literally this type of relationship is the one that is different above them all. It is different. It is different in the worst way, and we know that that is true. Romantic love gone wrong is by far the most devastating on the earth. And I can see why. 
Because even Christ himself said, a man will leave his mother and his father to leave to his wife and the two become one flesh. Not leave to his friends or his, uh, I don't know, teacher from school or whatever might be a relationship in this world that he might establish. But his wife. They're supposed to be best friends forever. And so when romantic feelings ensue between people, the prospect of that happening becomes real, right? And uh, so therefore there's like a, a lifetime reliance where this person is exactly you. Like you're basically bordering on being one flesh. And when, when that goes awry... That, that stings in a different kind of way. And so Jesus Christ so fit to describe then his own relationship with the church as that of a husband and a wife. He described it in and of himself as a romantic relationship. It's different. He didn't, yes, the Lord calls us his friends, indeed. But more than anything, we are his bride. We're his bride. It's romantic, right? The relationship between Jesus and the church, it is a romantic one. It is a cleaving that makes one become one flesh. It is a leaving of the father's house to come and get his wife and cleave to her. And the two become one flesh. Literally, that's what Christ did. He left his father's house and came down to the earth to cleave to us. And we are now becoming one flesh with him, those of us who embrace the gospel. So the, sh the sorrow then that Jesus feels when romance goes wrong. In other words, when his church goes awry, when his children are, are ill-disciplined, when the world um, of people that are being given the gospel is rejecting the message. The pain is like that of rejection in romance. We all know that when a woman dies, when a woman gets murdered, or when a man gets murdered, usually the first suspect in the case is always who? Their romantic interest, their romantic partner. When a woman or a man's body is found on the side of the street, having been stabbed multiple times, the police always speculate first as to who might have done it, concluding that it is the first suspect, really, in this is their romantic partner. Did they have a lover, a boyfriend, a dalliance, a person with whom they were having an extramarital affair, or a wife, or a husband? depending on whether they're male or female. Um, the police always go for that first, okay? They don't first assume that the mom could have killed her own son. They don't first assume that the dad could have killed his own son. They don't first assume that the uh, the friend could have killed her own, you know, a friend. Like he's the, like a man might have killed his own boy. They don't conclude that it's a, it's gang-related first. They, you know, like that this dude was a gang member and so maybe some other gangster rocked up and popped him. Um, they don't first reach the conclusion that his, like, schoolmates did this. They always first run to... Who was he with? Did he have a girlfriend? Was he married? Girlfriend? Married? Romantic partner? Dalliance? Side piece? It's always somebody that is intimately involved with this person in a romantic way that the police first gun for because the level of passion that comes in a romantic relationship is exorbitant and exquisite enough for it to motivate and indeed has for the trend and the historical records are all up in our faces, okay? It has got power to motivate a person to drive a dagger into the heart of their loved one. Crimes of passion, that's what they call them. The primary suspects in the murders of men and women across the world are always their romantic partners because there is such great and deep impetus, motivation in romance way it upon it going wrong that causes people to even murder more so than any other single type of relationship here on earth that is why suspect number one is always the girlfriend or the wife if a man has died and is on the side of the street having been buried or something um the lord also in uh describing his response to the church's misdemeanors on the ground against him is literally like a passionate husband neutralizing a wife that he has busted cheating. The way the Lord has dealt with Israel over the years, over the ages, who are his bride. Um, the way he has dealt with them shows what happens when you cheat on your husband. Like what would happen if a, a man came back home from work with a bunch of flowers for his wife and then like he's early or he's back from a business trip that was cut short by a couple of days and then he finds his wife in bed with some other oak. The dude could grab a kitchen knife and kill both of them, or a gun, kill both of them. Because just the, the, the betrayal, the depth of betrayal that is felt when a woman is going out on a man, or a man is going out on a woman with another man or woman. Um, just a depth, like cheating, adultery, is, is like, it exceeds your best friend who stood you up when you were supposed to go and play bowling at Rosebank, and then finding out that she went to a club with another girl, and that, like, stood you up that night. Like, you are not going to go to your girl's house the next day. And be like, oh, so you stood me up at the bowling alley so you could go rather, like, dance up and down at Taboo Nightclub with Rinelwe, Lerato, un, un capete Rinelwe. And then you go and you, like, stab her ten times because she ditched you for Rinelwe. No, but if a man is stood up at the bowling alley and his girlfriend was supposed to rock up and the two of them were supposed to meet, have milkshakes and bowl and have fun. And then he finds out that she stood him up because she was in the club with some other dude grunting and gyrating all over him. 
that can cause that guy to go to that woman and literally release a live round into her head, killing her for cheating. Finding her also in the act with some other dude can cause somebody to die. There are, there are motivations that come from romance to do things that just do not exist in other kinds of relationships, that just do not come in other kinds of relationships. So Jesus has indeed displayed, the Lord has displayed in the scriptures that just how much his relationship with individuals on the ground, on the earth's population, his relationship with us earthlings, with human beings, is like that of a husband and a wife. He kills for his bride. He sometimes even kills his bride when they are in an adulterous affair against him. The adultery of which is any kind of form of idolatry. Look at how he has just scattered, killed his bride over the ages for rebelling against him. Only look at the Jewish Holocaust. Only look at the Jewish Holocaust. Only look at the anti-Semitism in the world. Go and look at the scriptures read and gauge thoroughly therein that the Lord God Almighty is in the business of punishing even unto death his adulterous bride. He literally lays them waste. He puts them in famine. He suffocates the living daylights out of him for him being a mother hen wanting to gather his chicks to himself and they then giving him the middle finger. The Lord, look at how he laid waste with quail in the wilderness. His Hebrews that he released out from the land of slavery through Moses. And they were still groveling after seeing all those miracles. And they were like, we don't want manna. We want meat. We're sick and tired of this food. And so God gave them quail and they ate so much of it that they died in their numbers. Aaron's staff that stopped that plague from killing them. If Aaron did not put his staff down, all of them would have been neutralized, massacred. Look at how God nearly killed Moses himself for refusing to preach adultery like literally gawking there just unfaithfulness to the lord Zipporah, his wife had to stand in the gap by circumcising the son and say please don't kill my husband but then what was the punishment ultimately after the lord spared moses of moses for that sin initially all those years ago 40 years ago he was not allowed to enter the land of flowing with milk and honey so he died and only saw it from a distance and then was taken into heaven so he basically led people out from the land of slavery and didn't get to see the land flowing with milk and honey because of his initial rebellion Barbara's here, whatever, I don't care. Uh, because of his initial rebellion, he was uh, made to... Um, because of his initial re rebellion, he was made to miss out on basically the opportunity of seeing what it is that he worked so hard for. So he never got to reap the fruit of his labor. All of that languishing pain in the wilderness with all of the rebellion of the people of God, um, he never got to be rewarded for sitting it out. He basically missed out on it because of that original sin of trying to make like Jonah and not preach to Nineveh. But this time around in trying... Uh, sorry, in, uh, in refusing to go um, and... Um, and get the people of God out and saying that he stutters, he can't be the dude to take the part of the, the mission on board. The Lord does that. Look at what he did to, to, to David in his rebellion with Bathsheba. Literally, the sword never left his household. David's kids got killed. They turned on him. They tried to kill him, Absalom. Like, there, there is just such a heavy handedness that God walks in with peace. Look at Saul. Hey, after he rebelled and walked as an, as an adulterer, basically, against God, he lost his call. He lost his kingdom. He lost his position as king. He lost favor. He was laid waste and abandoned because he became a bride that decided to go and soil the marriage bed with adultery. That is what the Lord God Almighty does to people who ignore his charge, ignore his call, even though he has been so loving and so merciful to them, even though he has given them himself even though he has shown them that he can love them unconditionally, even though he has displayed that he desires that they should have more than just these meager scraps, that he will take their ashes and turn them into beauty. Like the Lord's call is so sweet. It is so sweet and so kind and so um, enamoring and so gentle and so covering and so, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Unconditional. That when you reject something like that, I mean, the, like, it's just, it's just a level of betrayal. It's like a really loving husband. Like I said, rocking up, like having had his business trip cut short with like a bunch of flowers and chocolates, happy to see his wife. And then he finds her in bed with another man. It's like, I literally do everything for you. Even the bed that you're in, I bought it. The house you live in, I bought it. The, the sheets, the, 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 the makeup you wear, the lipstick on your lips, the perfume that you put on your body. I buy you, every, literally, I do everything for you. When I'm on business, I think about you and I come back home with a purse that I've bought you. Literally, you are on my mind 24 hours a day. I just want to love you. And then you go and you grab the house that I have built for you and the bed that we lay on as a married couple and you put another gigolo in there. Somebody's going to die. So the Lord scattered the Hebrews, the Israelites, across the world and got them slapped with anti-Semitism everywhere they're at. They'd be given problems. 
they get given problems. Every country they live in, there is some form of anti-Semitism that's slapping the living daylights out of them. Some countries are worse than others. But for the better part of the time, the Hebrews really had a hard time. The Israelites really have a hard time. Do you understand? And the Lord w was so upset with them that Romans 11 even happened. He went and gave the promise of the Jews to the Gentiles. He said, the people who are not my people will now become my people. And the people that used to that never used to call me God will now call me God. And you will be jealous of them. He will go and get them in the tribulation right he will go and gather his chicks back to him again but in the run-up to he will replace them as a bride he will replace them with the gentile population that whole story is also depicted with the marriage of xerxes to um esther after he abandoned vashti the israelites or the hebrews are like vashti a disrespectful bride that doesn't realize she's married to a king and so really like honor the man and then she loses her position and a year later some other woman that's going to honor him um becomes his wife like god does that the lord has done that perpetually all throughout history to display just how bad like how deep how extensive how extreme the sorrow in his heart is when his church his bride his israel his gentiles that have given them life their lives over to him and embrace the cross when they act a fool what he does he hands them over he throws them out he puts them in exile in babylon he scatters them across the world he causes the jewish holocaust he literally causes anti-semitism across the world but then afterwards he gathers his children back to his land he gathers his people back to him. So it's basically a combination of judgment and mercy. A combination of judgment and mercy. If the Lord's relationship with the church is similar to that of a romantic relationship, and if his reaction to adultery um, is as extreme as we have seen all across the scriptures, then how much more extreme is the reaction of individuals down here on the ground when they're in romantic relationships? Because we don't have the omni-benevolence of God. We also don't have the self-control of God. Many of us even don't even have the slow to anger and the abounding and steadfast love that God has. We don't have the patience, the long-suffering, the forbearance of God. We don't have the strength of character that Christ has such that he can wait for his bride to just stop acting a fool already. He is patient. He goes and makes Hosea go and take Gomer, a prostitute, for a wife and literally sit her out and keep on fetching her from her hollow tree over and over and over and over again. He has a forbearance that we as the human race just don't have because we are born dead in trespasses and sins we've got issues we've got some problems Aja, in these streets and so we perpetually keep on dropping the ball we keep swelling ourselves and so god has made it possible for the prodigal son to come back home he endures us you know he suffers us long he forbears us for longer periods of time than we frankly deserve so if then we are like small tiny minuscule negligible bite-sized portions of what he is for we are made in his image we therefore also have small bite-sized negligible pieces or portions of that character that image of his that is in us is uh, uh, just a fraction of breath, a brevity, like a very negligible amount in comparison to what he has. Because we are fallen. We are fallible. And so because we are fallible and fallen, we do not have the long suffering and the patience and the forbearance of Jesus Christ. We do not have his long, what, what is this, um, slow to anger, like personality virtue. We don't have those attributes of God's operate of God operating in us 24 hours a day to stay our hands from acting harshly when we bust our wives in the act of cheating on us the first time around. Like, he literally awards with mercy and grace and mercy and grace to repent. 70 times, 7 times, a million times over. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be given comfort. Blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be given it. So God is in the business of constantly just having the back of people that don't have his back. He remains faithful when we're faithless, for he cannot deny himself. But we, we, we don't have that right, especially if we're not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even when we are saved, we still struggle to bear those fruit. We still struggle to really, truly walk in the kind of patience we need. We are tempted when we get like dogged to just drop the ball the first time around and that's it. We are tempted to just walk away from a person and hold our hearts emotionally stiffness or hold our emotions hostage to our stiff-necked pride. We are tempted to do stuff like that. And we sometimes run with it because our flesh is heavy. Uh, the Lord says that by the Spirit we need to put to death the deeds of the body, that we make war with the body, as it is written by Paul, as he is led by the Holy Spirit in Romans 7, that we make war with this body of death. Uh, and the war that we make with the body of death, we sadly, unfortunately, do not always conquer, even if we are people after God's own heart. Look at how David struggled to conquer his own flesh with Bathsheba. And he was a dude known as the guy, the man after God's own heart. Like, he was so godly that he had that reputation, that he had that as a description about him. And yet he was able to not subdue his flesh by the Holy Spirit um, to, to, to humility and not take another man's wife. So what then did David do after Nathan rocked up and rebuked him? Uh, he, he groveled. He went to God and was like, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. As it is written in Psalm 51. Like, do not let me like be 
separated from you. Abego, abego, God, don't, right? That is what David did. But in the run-up to this, you had the Holy Spirit to a point where he begged God not to take the Holy Spirit. So he had the Spirit indeed with which he could subdue the deed of his body that would take Bathsheba and just have a field day with her. But he ignored him. So in ignoring the Holy Spirit then, David grieved the Holy Spirit and only gained conviction after Nathan rocked up. So even after taking Bathsheba and killing Bathsheba's husband, he was still walking around like he didn't do anything wrong. This is the man after God's own heart. Like he's got such godliness that he's described that way. And yet he felt no funny way at all until some other dude rocked up and was like, hey, 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 do you not realize you've done something awry? You've gone awry. You've gone pear-shaped. There's something you've done that's whack and it's horrible. And as a result of, this, of it, the sword is not going to leave your household. That was David, right? God's own heart. He was after it. And he did not have a conscience about what he did to Bathsheba until somebody else knocked on his head and said, don't you see you have just stolen something from someone that only had that one thing, whereas you're a king. You got multiple brides for crying out loud. Like you just keep on taking women anywhere you go and you went and you grabbed the one woman that this dude had and then you went and killed him afterwards. So if David could walk in that level of insensitivity, then how much more people that aren't after God's own heart? How much more people who don't have the Holy Spirit, how much more the world of individuals that even though they're godly, they're not quite at the level of David. They still are like on eh? like they are on spiritual milk and not so much on solids. And so their potential or propensity to lose their consciences when they hurt other people is, is rife, it's rich, it's thick in them. We are not like God. We're not perfect in loving. We're not perfect in repent in um, acknowledging what's actually right and, 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 and due. God doesn't need to repent because he's God. He's perfect, right? And so since we lack perfection in that regard, is it not then necessary for people to every so often check inside their own hearts if they're not busy committing adultery against God, if they're not busy lying in bed with another man or another woman when they've got a spouse? Where is the conviction? Where is the conviction? Who is going to protect Sarah in Egypt when Abimelech or Pharaoh is all up in Sarah's grill? Crank had no, I'm not going to let you in. I'm not going to let you inside here. Um, do what you want, cat. Who is going to protect uh, uh, Sarah from rape, basically, by either Pharaoh or Abimelech, depending on which of the two stories you want to think of in the Bible? Where it is that Sarah was basically put up for being a concubine and a prostitute by her own husband because she was so beautiful. The kings of the lands that they went to looking for refuge um, wanted her. The kings of these lands, okay, Cran Can, please, I want to close the, the, the door since you're not even coming inside. Um, <clears throat> the kings of those lands wanted her um, and Abraham was like, just say you're my sister. And so she was basically subjugated to prostitution or being a concubine, just having her body had by uh, men who just see something they wanted and so they just take it. That was Sarah. That was the bane of Sarah's existence. Uh, Abraham did not have any kind of an attack of conscience um, in the run-up to Sarah being freed. Uh, Abraham did not, or Abram, Abraham. Well, with the situation with Pharaoh, first his name there was Abram, but by Abimelech it was Abraham. They'd already changed his name. So um, since uh, Abraham or Abraham, depending on which of the two stories we're talking about, in and of himself, did not feel some kind of way about the fact that he's left his own wife to be the concubine of some silly men that just want to grab what they want and run with it. She couldn't say no. She was just stranded in that. Who in the world is going to give an attack of conscience to Abraham or Abraham? Who is going to rescue Sarah from being reduced to a mere prostitute when she is supposed to be, when she is supposed to be the mother of the child of the promise? God himself intervenes. And I've even written something of this nature in my blog, right? I've written something in this nature. Like, I don't understand men, frankly, and how they are able to ignore feelings for women that they have for the life of them. Never felt that way about anyone concerning. Um, and I also don't understand any women that are trying to run with men. I know women are a lot more emotional, and I know that they're also a lot more willing to put their hearts on their sleeves than men are. But with this, like, evolving generation that we are in at the present moment, uh, women are becoming very masculine. They're becoming, they're getting these character flaws that men have where they claim to be okay um, to ignore their feelings and just be in relationships with men just, you know, for sex, like cuddy buddies and all that jazz. Yeah, it's starting to happen. It's a 21st century thing. Suck. Um, but mostly, like before before society went kind of awry and pear-shaped in that regard, mostly women were the ones that had to struggle with men that love them like no man's business, but that who, do, who just like absolutely refuse um, to acknowledge those feelings. And so we are the ones left to languish and grovel and sit around in the presence of Abimelech and Pharaoh when the men that we love are Abraham or Abram. But Abram has no attack of conscience at all. 
about the fact that his wife should not be anybody's prostitute or concubine literally being reduced to just a yet another like whore in the room that can be taken by any man like properly when, when a man has no such conviction do you not realize that he is in the presence or in the process at that time of committing adultery against God? A man who has been given a charge by the Lord to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And then he goes on right ahead and reduces that bride of his to Gomer. Seriously, like this woman wants to be godly, but she now has been reduced to the kind of woman that keeps on bouncing right back into prostitution again, even though she's married to Hosea. Who is going to make David grovel and mourn over what he did? Who is going to be the Nathan um, in the lives of these men who are into ignoring their feelings entirely? like romantic love is different so much so that god almighty in heaven himself describes his relationship with the church as that of a romantic partnership it's that passionate and that deep and so therefore the human race ought to be very careful when it comes to romantic relationships more so um than than with any other relationships they must be careful because when those relationships fail or when things go awry they have power to bring about random crimes like murder Random crimes like sabotage, random like fallennesses of spirit or of body or of consciousness, like mental illness. Like they have power to drive people into psychosis for crying out loud. Like fallen romances that make people go crazy. I don't know if you've seen the movie, Acrimony, the one with Taraji P. Henson. Like, like women can get that way. Like super crazy because romance has gone wrong. And I don't know if you've seen the movie, um, The Perfect Guy with, with uh, Sana Lathan and, and Michael Ely and um, Morris Chestnut. Like when a guy gets so severely broken by a woman that he loves until he becomes like a little bit of a psychopath, a creepy stalker that like can't deal. Like my ex-boyfriend is like Michael Ely in The Perfect Guy. He used to be an okay dude. He used to be a regular okie that is respectable out in these streets, but now he's become a psychopath. A psychopath. What did that? Romance gone wrong. Romance gone wrong has got power to give people mental illness that is irrevocable. Romance gone, gone wrong. Has got power to cause oh my goodness what do you want Hello, oh, vale. Oh, vale. Oh, vale. yes yes no ma had opened and they didn't come in no ma what do you need i wanted to say there's no handy not getting dishwashing liquid i phone you you phoned me, I phoned you, you phoned me, I phoned you, so... Yeah, no, so well, I, I was... Yeah. <sighs> okay. Let's just move on. Yeah, no, like, what's this? I was talking about my, my ex-boyfriend. He became kind of psychopathic, like, really crazy. Uh, and to this day, since I'm saying it, yeah, because when romance does not work, um, it, it has power to drive people over the edge, literally, you know? flip them into a new human being altogether like walk into a psychosis and you will justify that psychosis like those ways in which you're walking will feel normal to you at the time and so you will literally become kind of homicidal um against the person where love is not now working out where before you were you were an okay guy like you were a normal functioning thriving human being and now you're homicidal in other words you are disappointed romantically that things did not work out that way with somebody that you love too much to watch marry someone else or move on to somebody else. And so you start to become murderous. Where now you start to long for this person to just die. That is a judgment by God. To not recognize it as a judgment is in and of yourself to then be perhaps reprobate. When you start to be content with the prospect of the death of a person you love more than life itself, you have likely been the adulterer in the situation you have likely been the person to commit the falling out you're the person that has sinned you're the person that has done wrong and so you're the person under judgment when murder starts to become feasible when death when the death when the perishing of a person you once could not imagine living life without when that becomes feasible to you you're crazy now like romantic love has got power to do that in people and so i can't say this enough like while women are the ones that are happy to admit their feelings I think and I imagine that it is probably the best thing that men can do for themselves to stop ignoring feelings for the women they love because they get converted into psychopaths when these ladies and them do not end up together when these women and them have a falling out that is irrevocable irrecoverable when these women move on to the next guy that is happy to show them the love that they deserve these guys go crazy. Like, I can't stop using the case with my ex, um, richly enough. Like, he could have done what is right. And if he had done what is right, him and I would likely today be married. But today he's a crazy man. 
and he is unrecognizable in his character. His personality has entirely changed because the love of his life is not in his life and he can't fathom life without her. And so because she is the original and nobody ever has fitted into what it is that he is, everybody else is a round hole and he's a square peg. And for those reasons, his life is therefore awry and discombobulated and as discombobulated as it is feasible now, therefore it has become a necessary evil that I should die. I don't know how many times I have to keep warning this. Like, men, I'm not even supposed to be teaching men. I'm a Christian woman and it is basically forbidden by God for us to teach men or to exercise any authority over them. But because I care that people should not lose their minds, I, I feel it is necessary that I should like put this out there where men are concerned. Because it turns out that even Christian men pull stunts like this. Look at what David like did. Like the dude committed murder and rape as a Christian, as a person with the Holy Spirit, basically. So it turns out that even when people are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of the living God, they can still make foolish decisions. Look at the wrath of David, where he was about to have a whole bunch of blood on his hands by killing all of the men of the like land of Nabal because of being offended by what Nabal did. And a woman stood in the gap and stopped him, didn't it? Didn't it happen? Abigail rocked up and was like, no, don't do this. You're going to have so much guilt. Here is food for you and your men and your camels. Do not kill us. Nabal ended up dying alone from a heart attack upon finding out what David was going to do. And so he took his wife. As imperative as it is to stay your hand from teaching men as a woman, given that they're the ones more um, prone or subject or likely, really, frankly, to this disease of ignoring their feelings, allow me to just send a like, very gargantuan, resonating warning that ignoring feelings for somebody that is, frankly, the be-all and end-all, like your brain is forever, like a broken record, running all day long with this woman in your mind, when you love a woman to a point where you can't think about anything where nobody else compares out in these streets literally all other women annoy you they bore you because they pale in comparison but you're fighting with her you got problems you got issues and so you in your pride want to like push or proliferate some silly agenda and so you're going on to ignore your heart and your feelings to a point like i said where every woman that rocks up annoys you now because they just don't add up they don't add up but you think that you can survive and live because you're in the process currently of punishing this woman for something that they did not do women are usually the ones to grovel to their feelings first they succumb to their feelings. They say, look, my heart is big. And even though I'm annoyed at this prideful gangster, bottom line is I love him and I want this to work. Women are always the ones to put their pride aside where their feelings are concerned because they're so feeling. And then men, sometimes in the presence of a woman acknowledging that, fine, we're fighting this like sucks and I can't deal. Let's try and make this work. We got to fight this because, I mean, this is love. Like, it's big. Because men hate low, ha low, low hate low hanging fruit because men hate women who are not being chased and pursued because men have a thing about disregarding women who are the ones that are like ah pouncing on you so basically the apology of a woman is the worst thing that can ever come it's unfortunate it's unfortunate because how else do you reconcile and make right when you don't apologize but when women apologize to men they get crazy because men like to chase they like to be the ones to you know run after something that's running away from them and so when the woman is the one that's chasing because she realizes that she was wrong, so she's apologizing now uh, over what it is that, that perhaps was the war that was entered into, the guy starts to feel as though she's low-hanging fruit. Are you serious? Like, so you're content with a woman that will never admit, like, maybe that's why my ex and I lost it for so long. I never said sorry. Like, literally, throughout the relationship, whether or not I was wrong, I was like, uh, and he was always begging and groveling all up in my girl. Like, I never said sorry. But Christ taught me sorry. Jesus taught me, apologize. The Lord said, you don't get to act a fool, run amok, speak smack, and be okay with me. If you want your relationship with me to be cool and for your prayers not to be hindered, you better go say sorry where sorry is due. And so because the Lord done taught me how to be humble in the presence of a war with a person to see, or look in the mirror to see where my errors might be. I know I'm the kind of person that goes ahead and apologizes to a person, but unfortunately men, men have got this built-in thingy-mabobby that's frankly quite diseased in them, where they can't for the life of them humor, humor, humor successfully, a woman that is the one to come back and grovel. Men want women that don't say sorry. Like my relationship with my ex probably lasted five years because I never said sorry. I was the diva that sat where I'm sitting and I was like, whatever. It was a booya. And indeed he did. Each time. That apparently was a ten amount of not like of not being low-hanging fruit. Except I think we need to redefine what low-hanging fruit is. Like biblical godliness, Christianity, like to walk in, in holiness in Christ. That is a very high fruit to be picked off a high tree. But in godliness comes things like humbling yourself and apologizing first. But when they need to have like facets or little hints of worldliness in you, you're not going to be able to appreciate godly beauty. 
It is written in God's word that the things of God are foolishness to the man or the woman who is perishing. So it is foolish then to the world when you are the first one to put your tail between your legs and say sorry. That is a weakness according to the world. Savagery is celebrated. Like pomp and arrogance and pride in this world is celebrated. But in the kingdom of heaven, we are women of a different status. 31 to be exact. Go check out that poem by ZZ. And so because we are women of a different status, when we see that there's something kind of awry with what it is that we have done, we put our tails between our legs and we apologize. That is what makes us high fruit as opposed to low hanging. But a man with a carnal mindset does not appreciate the things of God, does not recognize the glory and the beauty and the excellence therefore in an apology. So I keep saying this, like men, especially black men, you want women who are going to disrespect you perpetually, who will never say sorry, who will be the bane of your existence, who you have to grovel and beg even though they were wrong. You want to be with women that are unholy, unrighteous, entirely, um, getting, like, like Gomer. You want to keep on fetching prostitutes from harlotry. That's what you want. You don't want godly women that are happy to see that, look, I was wrong. And so they come and they bake you a cake and they like freaking give you a massage and they run a bath water for you just to say sorry and then you're like Hurr. and then you act like this thing with like stones in your freaking mouth. What do you live? You are like because the woman said sorry and so you go and you turn amount your wife to like low hanging fruit. Are you serious? Like I am walking in godliness by saying sorry. I am doing something I never used to be able to do. I am clearly a woman here that has been sanctified by the Lord. He has chiseled away at all of my pride and my arrogance and he has made me get over. Not being the first one to say sorry because I feel as if I'm going to lose my power if I say sorry. I feel as if I'm going to lose my strength. No, that's the world right there. The world prides itself in passing people that it loves shade. Just so you can be the one to have the upper hand. And so therefore cause a relationship that is trauma bonding. People in the world, especially these modern days where even women are like this, are the ones into ignoring their feelings. They're the ones that can have like an inferno an inferno, do you understand, of emotions in their heart over a particular person, over one particular subject, and then go on right ahead and treat that subject like the scum of the earth. Treat a person they love more than life itself like they're nothing. Like the world does that. Men in the world walk away from women they love because they want to be right. Women in the world file for divorce against men they are enamored with just so they can prove a point. Like people in the world do that. And it is so defeatist and I don't understand it. I've never understood it. I've always had that going down for myself. Even before I came across, I did say that. It is so defeatist to ignore your feelings because feelings have power to make or break a person. They can even bring a person into a psychiatric state where they now have to be put in a stray suit and have to be bound in that state lest they should go and pounce on an innocent person and end their life. Like emotions have got power to drive people off the edge. And people ignore them. I've never been one to ignore my feelings. And so for those reasons, I've been relatively successful at love and life until I came to Jesus and he trained me to say sorry. And so I became the kind of woman that does that. I became a better woman than I used to be. And now as a Christian woman, because I'm humble now, because the Lord is the one that like moves me when I am busy acting a fool. Because Christ won't let me stay in my sin and wallow in it for he cares for me, he disciplines me. I am now being born, like sorry, being brandished with a reputation of being low hanging fruit. Are you freaking serious? Because I said sorry? Where in the world are godly men? Even the Bible says a faithful man who can find. Where are godly men that will appreciate an apology and not act such fools? Where are men that are not so carnal minded that they will think a woman that says sorry is low hanging fruit? Like literally, when you come to the kingdom of heaven, if your world has been upside down, it flips right way up. You think appropriately. We are to demolish arguments and every lofty pretension that exalts itself above the most high and hold into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That is what we're supposed to do as Christian people. So we basically operate like we, we march to the beat of a different drum. We, we walk in the very opposite direction of the world. We are on a narrow road that leads to life that few there be that find. And so therefore we are not among the common general like scheme of things. Like things, the grain with which the world is traveling, we don't do that. So when then a person is responding to your godliness in a worldly way, of course you're going to look like you're freaking desperate. And that is the current bane of my existence right now. I don't know how many more freaking human beings I have to meet that I think are godly, that treat me in a very worldly typicality. I spoke yesterday about something that I got involved with for ever so briefly. And I am now languishing because it was romantic. I am in so much freaking pain that I can't deal. I can't sleep. I can't eat properly. I am struggling to freaking breathe properly. Like everything is falling apart. I'm getting new acne under my chin because of all the quarters on my skin in my body. I'm stressing. And nothing I do is working. Like I usually work out and I do whatever to get over. My mom treating me like trash. But this time around, I'm just not freaking recovering. And I have to go through this and languish for as long as it takes for me to get over this. And I'm pissed off at this point because I'm like, really? This person is acting a fool towards me. Only because after a season of exchanges, a brief little season of exchanges, I finally said, okay, I see where I'm wrong here. So I'm sorry. 
And that made the dude look at me like I'm low-hanging fruit. Does that just not make a person worldly then? Where in the world is my Nathan? And where in the world is the Lord's rebuke on Abimelech and Abram? I am having to come back and your jive and jing a prostitute. Your jive are sensually after having brought down all of my music videos, my dance videos, because I wanted to honor a man, given that my body now, it appears since we were engaged, was going to be given to him as a husband, so I better respect that space. And now I'm back to dancing again and I'm like, freak, man, like I'm a concubine now. I'm a prostitute now. I am Sarah in the household or the courtyards of Abimelech or Abraham. Not Abraham, who's Pharaoh. And so may the Lord, Abimelech and Dini, I'm tormenting on my poor poet all. May the Lord plague the crap out of you so I can be freed from being reduced to some stripping little woman dancing sensually for a bunch of horny men that frankly have no self-respect or dignity in this world. I need an Abimelech rescue. I do. I need the Lord to go and speak smash sense into Abimelech, into Pharaoh, on behalf of Sarah, because I am a woman that is supposed to give birth to the child of the promise, but my husband has given me over to some men who treat me like a freaking concubine. I can't deal. I even hate anybody at all that comments on my, my, my videos. Saying that you look nice and hot and say, I don't care to look hot and sexy. I've been thrown into concubine mode because some do think I'm freaking low hanging fruit because I said sorry. Lando Kona, wrongo in very many respects. Got away, I was wrong. I acknowledge and I admit it. And now I need to come here to counseling and therapy and speak sense into my own heart so I can conquer and overcome this flippant, irresponsible individual was oh, the heart of a woman that he can't afford to break because he loves me more than a fat kid loves cake. And yet, you will be the one to lose me, not the other way around. God will be the one to rescue me from the Abimelech life conditions that I'm in right now or the Pharaoh like conditions that I'm in right now. If I cannot be respected and appreciated as a godly Christian woman, and so therefore walk in godly Christian ways and do things like say sorry. Buy a man in my life and you know what? Good riddance. Like literally good riddance. But I need to get over this situation. Like black men, I can't freaking deal. Gave one more of you a chance and you pulled the same freaking stance again. I have been trying. Dalang in Zama. Been trying. Like literally you are into reverse psychology, gaslighting, all different kinds of things. Over women you love too much to freaking do that to. And then one day you get crazy. And when then you get crazy, you like, but like, God, why'd you make me crazy? God made you crazy because you are an adulterer. You are an adulterer and you are sinning against him. You're hurting his daughter. A woman that cannot afford more pain. A woman that cannot afford more persecution. A woman that cannot afford to be devastated in this way. And this time around, what you done brought into my daughter's life, she can't quite get over it fast enough because it's romantic. And so it's different. It is different. Because it is romantic. So it's not like her getting over her mother treating her like trash or her friends ignoring her on Facebook. This time it's love. And for those reasons, my kid is freaking sad. And we got some Abimelech type tenement Faron random. Trying to act as if though he is not in love with the best woman he's ever met and literally no one else compares because we are women of a different status. 31 to be exact. Many women have done excellently, but we surpassed them all. Literally nobody else compares. And yet I'm being treated. Like hang, low hanging fruit. I got a bone to pick with you black men. You're so freaking typical like all of you. You do the same things over and over and over again. And then when you lose the loves of your lives, you have the brazen audacity to go on and desire that they be dead. I pray that God rescues me out of this Abimelech slash Pharaoh situation himself. Because we're Abram. We're singing in I'm signing out on Christ's name, Crankade. Bye.